It's been five years of hearings, arguments, and appeals in the texting and suicide case. It's been playing out here in Massachusetts, but has gained national attention. And now Michelle Carter is behind bars after the state's highest court refused to delay her 15-month sentence for encouraging her friend Conrad Roy through texts and calls to commit suicide. When Carter was first convicted of involuntary manslaughter in 2017, three years after Roy's death, the judge summed up a case built around Carter's own communications with Roy and her friends. She indicates that she can hear him coughing and she can hear the loud noise of the motor. This court finds that instructing Mr. Roy to get back in the truck constituted wanton and reckless conduct by Ms. Carter. That echoed prosecutors' arguments that text Carter sent and calls she made to Conrad Roy the day he died amounted to her being present on the scene. And two months after Roy's death, Carter herself seemed to grapple with her culpability and a text she sent a friend about a phone conversation she had with Roy just before he died. His death is my fault. He got out of the car. I told him to get back in. Carter's lawyers argued that while the outcome was tragic, her words were protected speech. A panel of Supreme Judicial Court justices upheld her conviction, but Michelle Carter's appellate attorneys say the case is not over. There are First Amendment questions that still need to be answered, possibly by the U.S. Supreme Court. One of those attorneys, Dana Marks, joins me now. Nice to see you, Dan. Thanks for being here, along with Nancy Gertner, retired federal judge, senior lecturer at Harvard Law, who's also working on the case. Judge Gertner, thank you so much for being here. Dan, can you tell me briefly, summarize why you believe the trial court and the SJC got it wrong? Well, I guess the the most simple way to say it is Michelle Carter didn't kill Conrad Roy. You know, he made a tragic choice to end his own life. It wasn't the first time he had tried to commit suicide. Uh, but she didn't cause him to do that. She didn't force him to do that. And she didn't make that tragic choice for him. Uh, that event happened in the context of a multi-year relationship. It was incredibly complicated between two troubled young people, both struggling with their own mental health challenges. And it resulted in a suicide. But it was not something that... Uh, Michelle Carter caused and something she should be held legally responsible for. SJC uh, addressed that in part. The only verbal conduct punished in an, as involuntary manslaughter has been the wanton or reckless pressing of a vulnerable person to commit suicide, emphasis mine, overpowering that person's will to live and resulting in that person's death. We're therefore not punishing words alone, the SJC wrote, as the defendant claims, but reckless or wanton words causing death. What's your reaction to that? That's right. Well, you know, I think the problem here is that it characterizes the relationship in a certain way and characterizes Michelle and Conrad in a certain way, which I don't think the evidence supports. Uh, the notion that he was somehow a, a vulnerable young person and she was a mature, manipulative adult, it's just not consistent with the nature of the relationship. Why does she have to be a mature, uh, manipulative adult? Uh, if, if, the issue, if he is a vulnerable person and she said what obviously we know she said, why is that not enough? Well, the truth is they're both incredibly vulnerable people. And, and maybe in a flawed way, she's doing the best she can to try to support a friend while she goes through her own struggles. I'll tell you, Jim, two weeks before this happens, she begs him to go to McLean with her, where she's checking herself in for inpatient treatment for an eating disorder. She says to him, uh, I can't help you with this. You need professional treatment. And he refuses. In fact, shortly before that, he encourages her to have what he refers to as a Romeo and Juliet moment and to engage in a suicide pact. So the notion that, that she was somehow driving this, I think, is really belied by the evidence. Did you want to add something to that? Because you Cause motioned with <laughs> me, but I also have something I want to address. But well, go ahead. Well, I mean, the, uh, the First Amendment argument, to some degree, was argument, you know, 13 out of 14 arguments. The most significant argument here is that no one in the United States has ever been prosecuted and convicted for assisting suicide when they weren't present and didn't provide the means. She was 50 miles away when he committed suicide. Didn't we have a case, in, wasn't the case cited from 18-something in this state where a guy was on death row and one of his fellow inmates suggested he hang himself in advance and he did? Right. Isn't that precedent, even though it's 200 Eight, years yes, old? Yes, even though, it's, but that is the key. Modern precedent, nobody has ever been prosecuted. And most states, because it is fraught in the way that Dan describes because this issue is fraught. What, what did you actually cause? Somebody who, com who tries to commit suicide multiple times is the person who is most likely to succeed. And those multiple attempts occurred way before he knew Michelle Carter. So what ha most states deal with this with statutes. And where you say this is right and this is wrong. 
And those assisted suicide statutes never include speech. If he, by the way, if Conrad Roy was not a vulnerable person, had not tried to kill himself before, would you be making the same argument in defense of Michelle Carter, or would you not? Or is your argument dependent upon his state of mental health? No, I don't think our, our argument is dependent on his state of mental health. And that, that's one of the real problems at the heart of the SJC's decision, is we now know we've waded into an incredibly complicated, controversial issue with no ability to distinguish the cases that the public agrees are unsympathetic and merit prosecution versus the cases that we all agree are somehow sympathetic and shouldn't be prosecuted. If, if, if this state, as the Bristol County DA urged us to do, had a statute like dozens of other states that do criminalize this kind of conduct and said that convincing someone to kill themselves is a violation of state criminal laws. But that's the point. That would, that would likely, if they did that, that piece, which is where speech alone leading to suicide, You'd say it was is likely to be unconstitutional. Okay, can and we get to the, us, Jim, by the way. The Minnesota Supreme Court has ruled in exactly that case that it's unconstitutional to pass a law saying you cannot encourage someone or advise them to commit suicide. They've ruled it's unconstitutional. Can we get back to the thing that virtually everybody knows about this case, even though you were kind enough to share a letter to the editor that's about to go in the Globe that you think people misunderstand? Get back in. The judges talked about it. Virtually all of us in the media talk about it. But the thing that I don't quite understand from your letter, you argue that most of us, and by the way, I plead guilty to this, by the way, have mistakenly from time to time said that that was in one of the texts right. that she sent right. to Roy. Right. But it was in a, in a text sure. she sent to a friend, Sam Boardman, two months later, in which she said in her own words, I said to him, get back in. Right. But Why isn't was, that determinative? Well, it, it's not determinative in the sense that she is... That she said it, well, I mean. It's, yes, she said it. But first of all, the contemporaneous texts are totally inconsistent with that. When she couldn't hear from him anymore, the contemporaneous texts are... On the are, day. On the day. Moments after she says, where are you? I'm worried. I love you. And she starts frantically calling everyone. That's evidence of what her state of mind was then. This letter, two months later, in a rambling text message, is at a, it could could be true, I suppose, although it's weighted, it's it's counter. Didn't she by say the on the same day it, it's time to do it now? Didn't she say that earlier on the day that he committed suicide? It wasn't all take care of yourself, don't do it. I mean, she did a absolutely, and and no one's trying to sort of deny the facts. The text messages are in the public record. Yeah. People, and I encourage people to go and read the tens of thousands of them. Yes, <laughs> there are things that, in retrospect, I'm sure she would rather have not said in text messages, but. There is no evidence other than her own statement months later in a rambling text message that she ever told, that he ever stepped out of his truck or she told right. him to get back in. And you say and that that's not true because she was traumatized? Or well, well th th this is part of the problem, is the Commonwealth wants to have it both ways. When it's convenient for them, they cast her as the consummate fabulist. She'll make up any story to be the center of attention. She drives him to commit suicide to get more friends at school. But... When they need it to be a piece of evidence, the only piece of evidence to convict her in this case, we are supposed to take this phrase in a, in a pages and pages long text somehow as gospel. Is this going to the Supreme Court of the United States, we'll or at least we'll, you hope it does? We'll take it to the Supreme Court. You put, you put someone her age on these facts into prison, you know me, we'll take it as high as it can go. And by the way, but the likelihood is good, assuming she serves a decent chunk of that 15 months, that even if the Supreme Court were to take the case, she probably will have served her full sentence. Right, that's why I was shocked that we could not get a stay. stay the the classic situation for a stay is where the sentence is so short that the legal issues will take longer to litigate and she will have suffered when this is reversed. You know, one last thing with you. I think the only thing that the public agrees upon is these were two troubled people Absolutely. who really both needed help and sadly one didn't get it and hopefully the other one did. She didn't speak the other day. How is your client? How is Michelle Carter? Look, I mean, I think she understood that there was a very high likelihood that her sentence would start on Monday. As much as we tried over the weekend and Monday morning to get the SJC to stop that yeah. uh, and to impose a stay, I think she was prepared for that eventuality. But no one's ever really prepared to go to prison, certainly someone like her. I mean, it, she never expected any of this to happen. Mm -hmm. It was five years ago. It's been a very long wait. It's been agonizing for her and her family. Uh, and so this is, a, this is a difficult time, but she knows that we're going to keep fighting. And your uh, statement should be in the Globe probably tomorrow if people want right. to read all no of it. No one has ever been prosecuted on any set of facts like this in the country, and we shouldn't be the first. Judge, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. It's good to meet you, too. Thank you thank so you, much Jim. for your time.